from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's editorial director, and today we're going to be talking about the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. To help us make sense of things, we're joined by Marvin Weinbaum, the head of MEI's Afghanistan and Pakistan program, and a longtime Afghanistan watcher. Marvin, welcome back to the program, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's dive right in. I think everyone's been watching the, the headlines and seeing what's, what's going on in Afghanistan. The speed with which things have unraveled has been really shocking and surprising. How did all of this happen so quickly? Why was the, the Taliban able to advance with, with such speed? Well, certainly, as you indicate, nobody had anticipated this. The feeling was that, yes, the central government was in trouble, but that there were elements around the country that were going to put up a reasonably strong resistance. As it happened in a matter of eight days, we saw this crumble. Now, there are the long-term reasons for this having to do with the character of the Afghan military and it's uh, the corruption, the poor leadership. I might add, not the courage of the Afghan soldier who has been taking uh, the brunt of the casualties for a long time. In fact, they've had control of the combat responsibilities since 2014. So we don't want to fault the the foot soldier, but certainly some of the officers uh, do deserve every blame. Now, those are the long term having to do with the general character of the of the regime and the faith in the regime. But but the trigger here, there are really two. One was the agreement signed a year ago in end of February, which committed the United States to leave. An agreement which the government of Ashraf Ghani had no part in and therefore did not represent their interests. But this commitment really sent shockwaves through the Afghans, but nothing like the response, the reaction that happened when President Biden announced in April of this year that uh, we were going to essentially honor what had been agreed to a year earlier, although we would be delaying our actual departure from May until the 11th of September. That set in motion, I think, a great deal that followed and having to do primarily with the fact that everyone in the military and elsewhere recognized that what was coming out, what was now coming out were American, not only American forces, but also the training advice that we were giving, the logistics, the intelligence, and above all, air support. When that was clear that that was going to disappear, uh, this meant that the kind of close air support that the Afghan soldier had anticipated always to get him out of a jam, to to relieve him when he was he and his units were trapped, this was eventually going to disappear. So it everything was on a weak plane, and finally we came down to these last eight days where it all seemed to come home to roost. And all of the misgivings, all of the doubts, all of the fears really came to the surface once it became clear that the Taliban had the momentum. Marvin, what is the return of Taliban rule likely to mean for for Afghans? What do we know so far about the areas that have come under their control? and, And what are your expectations going forward? It's hard to know what it's going to mean here across the country. In those rural areas where they have had control, it's been a mixed picture. In some, they have duplicated the kind of behavior that we saw in the 1990s, uh, the kind of restrictions on on women, on all kinds of cultural events, just on the movement of people in general. But now, only now, where they are controlling population centers, do we really have to raise the question, what is it going to mean for the, for the cities? And that, of course, is not clear. The early indications are that the Taliban are going to make heavy demands here when it comes to religious practice and general social behavior. Whether they'll allow any kind of media freedom is doubtful, but, but we'll see. 
What they do want to accomplish now, I think, is to suggest that we want as normal a transition as possible. So they will play up the idea that somehow much of life as it has been can continue, albeit within our boundaries of exceptions. Marvin, I believe you were on the ground in Afghanistan not long after the Taliban took control of Kabul last time around, back in the the late 1990s. How does what you're seeing so far kind of compare to that? Well, it's entirely different. In 1997, when I was in Kabul and Jalalabad, you have to call those areas ghost cities. There was virtually no one around. Large portion of the city had fled, gone into exile and mostly in Pakistan, some in Iran. There was no economic life. There were certainly no women to be seen on the streets. Today, if we went and dropped in in Kabul this very moment, we would still probably see it a very vital city with lots of people uh, moving around. Now, Now they're moving around with a great deal of fear, of course, as to what is going to follow. But the society came to life over the last 20 years in every conceivable way, and we shouldn't minimize this. This was a rebirth of a country which, however fragile it was and however its shortcomings, nevertheless saw the birth here of all kinds of civil society activities. How long this will continue remains to be seen, but it's going to take a lot to uh, eliminate that. Looking at the potential longer-term consequences of the, the Taliban takeover, what are, your, what are your biggest concerns? They are essentially the tragedy for the Afghans that they, that they have so feared, that they will sink back gradually into the kind of country they had in the, in the 1990s. I don't think that they're worried about violence at this point too much, The Taliban seemed to have things well in control, just as they did in 1997. Uh, They were fully in control. So at least, and this is not unimportant, at least they won't be as fearful here uh, for their lives. But their lives consist also of being able to earn and have an income and to be able to express themselves. This will change for them. Many of them now will be finding their way out of where they are simply because it's not feasible to remain in place, not because of fear, but again, the overwhelming fear is going to be that, or concern is going to be that there is no source of income and they're going to be dependent upon humanitarian assistance and it's going to be in the cities that they're likely to see that delivered. Marvin, how is the international community responding so far? I see uh, China has said it's ready to, quote, deepen friendly and cooperative relations with the Taliban. Are we likely to see other regional and international powers follow suit? There had been a great deal of talk here about how the Taliban ought to behave, because if they don't, particularly if they try to seize the country militarily, they're going to become pariahs, they're going to be denied assistance which they said to want very badly. Well, the truth is, yes, the Taliban would love to see assistance now of all kinds. It would love to have recognition. But what we've learned about the Taliban is they'll give nothing in exchange. As far as the countries in the area, to the contrary to belief that somehow they're going to to now put pressure on the country to change, It will be now that they will be coming to the Taliban and saying, how can we normalize relations? How can we assure, be assured that the turmoil that has been inflicted on Afghanistan uh, and also meaning the radical militancy that we've seen there, how is that going to affect us? They are all concerned with containing Afghanistan. That is leaving what has happened in Afghanistan in Afghanistan. And so what we've already seen with the Chinese, with the Russians, we will see more clearly with the Iranians very shortly. And with Pakistan, it's always been there that we will have to accommodate you. As far as the West is concerned, that's another matter. On that point, what about the U.S. government here? How should it approach the issue? Should it engage the Taliban? And if so, how? 
Right now, that what the Taliban want is to see the backs of the Americans. Uh, he has no interest here in developing any kind of relationship with the United States. Now, having said that, if the United States wants to turn around and provide uh, all kinds of aid, and we will, we will offer at least humanitarian assistance, but we won't do it directly as we have recently uh, in, in the past. We will work through international organizations, non-government, as well as, as UN-alike organizations. We have to be expecting that the United States will have limited contact here because politically it will not be possible to really reach out to the Afghans. I'm also saying, however, that they're very suspicious of us, that any kind of involvement in the country, they'll see very likely as, as a threat, as a way in which the United States is seeking to get back into the country. Marvin, before we conclude, where do you see things going from here? In all likelihood, the Taliban will fully consolidate their position in Afghanistan very shortly. There may be pockets of resistance, uh, although those that we expected were going to be out there as a problem for them, they, they all folded very quickly, as quickly as the Afghan National Security Forces did. That is, these various militias around the country that were supposedly so well-equipped and well-motivated to withstand the Taliban. There's one remaining area which is symbolically important. It's called the Panjshir Valley. It's just north of Kabul. And that's an area where even when the Soviets were there, no one really fully conquered that area. I don't think that's going to be much of a problem for them. So what we're staring at now is probably a question mark about what is not going to happen immediately, but what's going to happen over the midterm and the long term. That is going to be very hard to say. I think that the idea that somehow they're going to put the clamps on groups like al-Qaeda and Islamic State and the TTP, which is the Pakistani Taliban, or the various insurgent groups that aim at China and uh, Uzbekistan, this is unlikely. They have a great deal in common with these groups ideologically. So I see no likelihood that they're going to somehow leave the United States and, and the global community in general satisfied that somehow they needn't worry about these groups. These groups now, like the al-Qaeda and the Islamic State or ISIS, these groups at the moment don't pose very much of a threat. But if Afghanistan becomes anything like what it was in the past, and it was an area in which these groups could operate rather freely, they're going to grow. There, there is space for them to grow, and they will in time perhaps constitute a challenge. I know the president has said that we will go after them, but we don't have the resources that we have had very recently to be able to identify where they are, uh, what they're up to. And without this kind of on-the-ground intelligence, it's going to be very difficult for us, even with our various surveillance mechanisms, to be able to really understand the degree to which they will pose a threat to the West and to the United States. We'll have to leave things there for now, but this is an issue we'll be watching very closely, and I have no doubt that we will have you back on the program soon to see how things are going. Marvin, thank you very much for joining us today. Sure. Thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.